Welcome everyone out there. My name is Jeffrey Goodman. I'm the Director of Marketing and Development for the YMCA of Northwest Louisiana and we're here today for Shreveport Bossier, my city, my community, my home. And today, among other things, we are talking donuts with Caleb King. So Caleb, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, so hop, let's hop in, Caleb. Um, my first question for you today is, I've heard that your wife, Michelle, and you were out in California camping, came to Shreveport over Christmas, and less than two weeks later, decided to move here. Tell us what, what transpired during that trip to Shreveport that convinced Michelle and you to move here. You know, we're still kind of picking that apart two years later, uh, but I, we came back to see the fam, um, had a great Christmas together. It was right in the middle of COVID, you know, all these disruptive things happening um, and big decisions suddenly seemed doable and small and uh, not such a big deal after so many disruptions of the, of the previous year. So we came down no intention of moving. We were going to go to Florida for the winter and kind of hang out because both of our jobs were on hold in Canada. Um, went down to New Orleans for New Year's, came back saw a house we loved and we looked at the price we're like is this serious is this you know are they serious about this and put in an offer on a whim uh didn't end up getting that house but got another one a few weeks later and uh picked up stakes and and here we are michelle moved back a little a few months after i did um but uh you know the the community the family suddenly seemed really important you know in your 20s and 30s, you're looking to get away and do your own thing and put your own stamp on the world. And then um, I think 40 was coming at me really quick and I knew we wanted to have a family and um, you know all of those small town things that you're so wanting to get away from when you're a kid suddenly just seemed like a positive and, a, and a, just kind of drew us back and uh, the people have been great and so far it's been a good decision for us. So let's talk drip uh, for a sec, which I've seen described as craft sourdough donuts on wheels. That's it. I've got a bunch of questions around drip here. Uh, what is drip? How did you get the idea to start it? Do Michelle and or you have culinary backgrounds? And if not, how did you learn such gourmet skills, both in terms of taste and presentation? I, drip is a harder one to explain than the move back to Shreveport. I don't really know. Um, so I did go to culinary school for three semesters in Toronto, but more as personal enrichment. I never thought I would work in professional food preparation, ever. I was a home cook. I enjoyed it as a hobby. And during COVID, I started baking a lot, like a lot of people. You know, you're just trapped at home. You look for, for things to do for fun. and. We were baking constantly. And my second date with Michelle, we, we actually baked and made ice cream, you know, these wholesome things. And uh, after kind of deciding to move back to Louisiana, I don't think it was conscious, what are we gonna do? But I knew we needed to do something. And we were baking for fun. Um, I started making donuts for fun. Next thing you know, I had ordered a 20 quart mixer that arrived on a pallet from the truck. And I was like, wow, this is getting kind of serious. And uh, I thought, you know, well, we've got this van because we were camping out of this van. You know, it was like our, our house on wheels. And I was like, well, Michelle's pregnant now. We're not going to be camping much. What can we do with this thing? And um, I ended up walking into Andrus Entrepreneur Center down on Crockett downtown and talk to Jim Walsh about, you know, how can I make some money out of this idea? And he connected me with Cohab, which is a shared kitchen and workspace, uh, kind of a, a starter, an incubator, down under the Texas Street Bridge. And that's where Drip got started, really. We had a huge kitchen at our disposal. I was able to get creative to do things that you can't do in your own kitchen and scale up a little bit. and. Um, it was really affordable too. So I was able to make mistakes cheap, you know, without making a huge investment. We did buy a lot of donut equipment. It's a specialized business. You can't just fake it. You need like huge kettles and 
proofers. And so we got the equipment and started doing three flavors. And I remember I did the first one at Great Raft Brewery and people were lining up for it and they weren't even good back then. Like I was, <laughs> they were terrible, they were sticky. And, but uh, I th you know, it was motivating to get that response. People were like, this is different, this is odd. You know, that somebody's taking a chance here. And to get that feedback and that excitement from the community really motivated us to, to give it a go. So you know, we started hiring, we scaled up, we got a spot at the farmer's market. Um, we started doing uh, neighborhoods through the uh, Architects Food Truck Alliance. We started booking neighborhood events. And next thing you know, you got 30, 40 people standing in line for donuts and you're like, well, maybe we can make a go of this. So it happened really organically. I don't, I think it was a subconscious recognition on my part that there was nothing like it in Shreveport and I wouldn't be competing directly with anyone in that market space. I mean, obviously there's a ton of great donut shops, but they're all a commodity product and they're all pretty similar, you know, in a lot of ways and they're competing, you know, for location, not really for, for product. Um, so we said, why not, let's try it. And so far we've had really good uptake and um, it, it keeps us going every day. And how did, how did you, when you were starting out, I mean, you had to do some research around donuts. Are you doing that? Are you, are you making contact via phone with people somewhere else that make donuts? Are you doing this all on the internet? Like, what is, talk to me a little bit about that Both. research process. So part of the research was subconscious while we were traveling in the van. So we went, I don't know, all over the West Coast, all through the Southwest, all through Canada never cooking for ourselves, we were just stopping and eating all these different cities. Portland especially was uh, has a great food culture. Um, a lot of West Coast cities do. And we had enough experience, both, of, both Michelle and I are, are pretty well traveled anyway, and then during COVID, to stop at all these bakeries and lunch spots and, and see what's possible and see what people are doing in the food industry and all these other places, it was kind of, um, an unintentional research and development phase for this business and it prepared the way for us to see it's not so crazy to, to do this and to elevate this product and be able to charge more for for a superior product and people you know we didn't have the fear that people would reject it because we had seen these things succeed in other places so that was I guess the groundwork for that kind of elevated donut product the actual recipe groundwork was very hit and miss um, I played with a ton of different recipes um, and you end up running into a lot of technical issues when you're trying to scale up into like a 30 quart batch of product instead of a you know KitchenAid mixer. Um, so we started researching a lot of purveyors that could help um, and I got connected with really good uh, well experienced donut guy out of Dallas who had opened like over 140 shops and sold them on. Anyway, he was he was kind of the mentor getting started and he helped us get it outfitted and, and scale the recipes. Um, and the sourdough product is pretty unique. I think there are a couple of East Coast bakeries doing it, but there was nobody in Shreveport and definitely no, there was nobody in Louisiana or Texas doing it. And we thought, let's give this a shot. And he helped us um, perfect it and, and get it off the ground. And, um, it just, it's been trial and error ever since with the, the flavors. You get instant feedback every day, whether people buy it or not, and whether they buy it again. So you can't really fool yourself. You look in your case at the end of the day and what's left over is what's not working. So it's it's really uh, very quick feedback and you can, you can adjust really quickly to what the customer wants and, and what they're excited about. And you know what you need to make every day or people are gonna be upset that it's not there. So it's just been kind of like business 101, a real baby step thing, you know, very basic inputs, very basic outputs, and uh, we're responding to what the customers like. And not many people have, have seen as many sides of our community in as short of a time as, as you guys have. Uh, Drip's been from Blanchard to Stonewall to Benton and everything in True. between. So, 
I did confirm this before we started. You, you grew up here as, as someone who is newly back to town. What about this community has jumped out at you as being the same as when you grew up here? Definitely the focus on family life, you know, and, and the building of community around family. Um, you don't really appreciate it when you're younger, but coming back, that's really the, the focus of, of Shreveport Bozier. It's not really about, it's kind of a selfless culture in a lot of ways. A lot of people just kind of give themselves to, you know, raising their families. And um, and that's true wherever you are in, in Shreveport Bozier area. Um, that's jumped out at me a lot. Um, it's kind of different in a city, I think, coming from Toronto, family is almost a luxury there you're you're just trying to get by trying to support yourself and have fun for yourself and if you're actually able to have a family someday then that's a bonus you know but here that's kind of the that's what people do um and the donut product is really translated well into that because it's universal like, you know if a three-year-old kid wants a donut the parents want the donut and uh it's been fun watching that Dynamic, and I, you know, you can kind of pick what they want before they get to the truck, you know, and uh, <laughs> and and being able to to see that smile and get that response, um, and you know, Michelle brings Edwin on the truck sometimes, and and people like that. People really like to connect with the family way, and we kind of post little updates about the fam on our social media. And people connect. Or, How's the baby? You know, I heard you have another one. You know, it's just it's it's kind of a real community event and we have uh we've made great friends through donuts even you know just uh people that are, are fans of the truck and of our story and um it's it's been fun to see that response and get that get that uh kind of warm feeling from the community i mean they're really appreciative like we could go to we we go to blanchard and people are like thank you thank you for coming out here and i'm like thank you for buying my product <laughs> don't thank me but they're, they're really excited to have someone try something different and take a chance and come out to wherever they are. You know, um, you can be in Houghton at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. You've been up all night making donuts, and people will come stand in line and, and be grateful that you're there. And that's, that's really cool. Talk a little bit about that process of how you determine where you're going to be a specific day or a specific week or how you find new locations and just uh, how that whole system Best is. analogy I've figured out is it's kind of like it's like going fishing you just never really know where what's what's going to be good on what day um you get a little sixth sense the more you do it and who's you know who can turn out their neighborhood who can post for you on social media and figure it out um it's really fun um trying to judge from the response on on your posts on social media, what what the response, how much you should cook, because you don't want to have leftover donuts. That's a no no. That just that's a heartbreaker to have to come home with a bunch of product. So you estimate the cook based on the response from the neighborhood, um, and then also like fishing, you don't go back very often. You can't keep hitting the same spot. You let it cool off. You know you let the excitement build again. You go back. Um, and hopefully, you know, you have a good day and you, you, you're able to sell your donuts and, and make sure everybody's happy. Um, it's just a feeling thing. It really is. Sometimes you think it's going to be huge and then you're just crickets. And then sometimes, like I had one, I think the neighborhood is called Belmere in Benton. It was raining. It was freezing cold, just murderously cold. And the wind was blowing so hard, I couldn't even put up a sign on the thing. And there were 30 people standing in line to buy donuts on Sunday morning. You know, like kids were wrapped in blankets <laughs> in the rain. And, it, you know, there's these, these things that there's you can't predict. And it's, it's a, a really exciting experience to uh, sometimes, you know, hit a home run. And, and sometimes, you know, you have your tail between your legs. But... Uh, I think over time we've kind of figured out how to judge it and how to, you know, how not to get over prepared, I guess. But that's been the fun part, honestly, is 
trying to trying to pick and um, it's also tough because we we're not able to answer a lot of texts I mean we just get inundated with stuff and it's just two of us and we're trying to live a life so I do feel bad sometimes we're not able to to really answer everything and do everything for everyone but um, that's just part of it you know, we're only two people so a new neighborhood you've never been to, maybe hadn't even heard of before. Like, how do you? How do they get on your radar? Uh, they, is they're it, usually persistent. They're they're contacting you saying, right. "Hey, we've heard about your donuts. We'd really like you to come here. Would you consider coming here one day?" Right, and usually I'm booked up for three weeks already, and I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, I've had four requests like that, and you don't, and you're like, okay, whatever. You try to answer it. But the persistent ones will contact you again, and they're like, we want you to come here, come out here. And you're like, well, you just end up saying, okay, I'll do it. And then uh, we kind of figure out how many houses are in the neighborhood. We ask, you know, um, is there a central area we can park? Um, Can you guys advertise for us? And then we try to pick a good time. Like if it's in the evening, we try to book with another food truck because that helps everybody out. You know, they get their dinner, their dessert. Um, and if it's in the morning, we try to do it like on a, a weekend or an event, like a, a holiday or something like that. And uh, that's been how we started doing it. Um, it's a little bit, the, the mornings are tough just because with an eight month old, you know, there are only so many mornings you can wake up at one in the morning and, and work all night. and be sane so we try to limit that to one or two mornings a week Um, but yeah it's persistence usually is people just keep calling you or whatever and you you figure it out Um, but we're lucky to to be in that position and not have to really go knock on doors and, and find places to set up it's really I never expected that to happen I thought we would have to hustle and I mean, we're definitely hustling, but I thought we would have to find places to to set up, but they've definitely come to us. Awesome. Well, going back to kind of a previous question of, you know, you're newly back to town, what looks the same? So kind of flipping that, you're newly back to town. What what has jumped out at you in these two or so years that you've been back as being different than what you remember growing up here? I think... From a business perspective, what's jumped out at me is how little has changed, really. I mean, I was at Cane's the other day, and I think of Cane's as kind of a new Shreveport restaurant. That location's 17 years old. I mean, there has not been a lot of business development and new. I mean, we've got Smalls now on Uri. There's, you know, there are a few things coming along. There, you know, there's some some strip mall stuff on Uri, but. I mean, louder, I guess, is kind of new. There's there's some stuff, but the staples are the staples. They're the same as when I was growing up. I mean, Southern Made Donuts. You know, you've got your uh, Monjunis. You've got all of these institutions that are still here, Strawns. I could go on. But what's really striking is there hasn't been a lot of, of fresh stuff, or I, I would say enough fresh stuff. But there's demand for it. There's, uh, you know, people here work hard. They've got money to spend. Um, cost of living is pretty low. People love to eat. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of real innovation. Um, I mean, I get that's that's kind of casting a wide net. I mean, there's there's Zuzel. There's there are new restaurant tours. There's new stuff coming coming here and there. But um, from an overall perspective in the food industry. It's been a pretty static 20 years since I left. I mean, compared to most most other cities you would visit, there's huge turnover and huge innovation in that business. You know, five years for a restaurant's a pretty good run. So um, that gave us a lot of motivation to to try different stuff and to um, you know to give it a go because I really felt like the demand was there. I don't. Are you familiar with Crumble Cookie? Yes. I haven't, so, well, I've seen them. I haven't had one. I have had drip, and yeah. I can tell everyone out there if you haven't had one, get one as soon as you can because it's life changing. I love it. But yeah. The, I think Crumble's a great example, too. They've got, you know, they, people will line up for a product. And just able, being able to see that, 
it's not the consumer's fault. It's it's the uh, no one's taking a chance and giving them something to buy, something to get excited about. And that's what we wanted to do is, is give people something to get excited about, something to be proud of, something to bring your friends when they come to town or, or your family when they come to town for holidays. We have a lot of people do that. You got to try this. Come on. You know, it's not Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. Um, we, got, we get huge orders. We did special orders and, you know, people want their family to, to try this product when they're in town. This is a new thing in Shreveport. Um, so that... You know, there hasn't been a lot change, a lot of change in that. Um, I'm trying to think what I, what I thought changed the most. Maybe the lack of change was why I felt so comfortable. I mean, like, I don't need navigation to get anywhere here. You know, you just, you're like, you grow up, oh, take a left on firm, you know, it's, there hasn't been a ton of new, I mean, there's some new housing out south of town or whatever, but. It's still the same city it was 20 years ago. Um, and, and the lack of what do you what do you attribute that lack of innovation to? Is it a lack of is it is it a lack of courage? Is it a lack of encouragement? What? It's a good question. I think there is a certain. I mean, I think it's pretty easy to live here. You don't really have to take a lot of risk. Um, and maybe that that leads to a a certain amount of no need to, of unwillingness to take risk or complacency or uh, conformity is maybe a little harsh but I don't know if you don't need to take a chance then why would you I mean cost of living is low housing is cheap um, I'm sure that sounds ridiculous in this inflationary period someone living here but comparatively speaking this is not an expensive place to live um, you know, I guess that's it. And I, I know that a lot of people I went to school with and young people, the the more ambitious, innovative set, you know, tries to give it a go in, you know, a bigger market. Or, you know, you lose a lot of the, the, um, the more ambitious young people. Because um, I was certainly ready to, to light out for the territories when I graduated LSU. Um, but then you get into the real, the real uh, fray of, of the big city, the big life, and uh, that's its own can of worms, you know, that's, that's its own issues. So, I don't, I, you know, maybe that's what's attractive about Shreveport is that you can just be, you know, you can, live well here without really having to take huge risks and maybe that's part of the appeal but it, from a business perspective that was a really exciting reason to move back really exciting I mean honestly drip in San Francisco would not be an, ex an exciting product I mean it would be but I'm not sure we would have 50 people lining up you know what I mean um, so being able to innovate or do something just a little different in a place that doesn't have a lot of that, I think is is um, super attractive for us moving here anyway. I'm gonna go off for a second. This may not make sense, but I'm thinking about it anyway. As you're talking, you know, like a lot of people, I think, like in the arts or even in business, need like someone alongside them that's doing similar things to either serve as competition or to kind of keep raising the bar right. to give you something to kind of chase or to keep you inspired or keep you motivated like it doesn't sound like you necessarily need that or have that um or am, am i looking at that incorrectly no, or it's what true but i think social media and internet also help create your your own bar i mean a donut shop in new york 30 years ago would be totally irrelevant to you but when you're able to see what they're doing on a daily basis, it inspires you and it gets you, it gets us more creative and and excited about trying new products that we would never have thought to do. You know, so we are working alongside innovators. We're just working alongside them from a distance, um, and and seeing all of these incredible things that bakers are doing nationally. 
um, is how we're able to, to help you know create and and do new things and try new things um, and it's just a it's a net positive for everyone involved it's a net positive for our customers um, for us in the kitchen you know getting excited about new things um, so that has made the world smaller in a lot of ways and um, and they may not be direct competition but they're more like inspiration you know they're, they're donut influencers you know who you know give us great ideas and, and help us create new stuff that makes perfect sense I didn't even think about that from a global or just right. a, a, a more um, macro um, perspective it does. okay so um, my next question is it, it seems that drip has been a great success um, for people out there listening to this who aspire to start their own business in town what advice or suggestions can you provide? I think I could only really provide advice for the food industry. I mean, not that I really have much experience in it, only a couple of years, really. Um, but that would be to focus on one product or a really small segment um, and take something that people love that you know people like put your own spin on it just just enough where it's it has to be accessible it can't be so wild that it scares people off and we we ran into that with the donuts you, you know a lot of people are like where are the glazed you know you, you've got to you've got to have that connection to what people like and, and is familiar and it has to be just enough different. Well, they'll take the chance and give it a try. Or it, have, it can have some tie-in to something they already like. Like we have a praline donut. And who doesn't like pecans? I mean, every, pretty much everyone. So they'll see this, and it looks a little wild. And I don't know, it's $4. But I like pralines, and I like donuts. I'm going to do it. So I think giving a connection to a product people already like, taking something that you know is successful and just a tiny bit of, uh, of, of innovation added to it. And the marketing, I guess, is, is the, dif the difference. Um, with Drip, we had something just a little different too. We had the van, donuts out of a truck. You know, it's odd, it's different, uh, but it's not, so different that it scares people off you know everybody will stand in line and give it a shot you know it's not that weird um, but that was all organic I think we just kind of lucked into that um, it's the getting started that's difficult because you need the capital but we were really fortunate with Cohab to be able to start small enough where if it had failed and we'd fall on our face it wouldn't have been a big deal um, you know, just get up, try something else, go again. Uh, but having cohab, having a, being able to start cheap and try stuff, I think that's really important. Um, there are a couple. There, MS Kick has a big commissary kitchen. Cohab, there's another one on Jordan Street. Um, I would say that's really helpful. It also gives you mentors in the business, or you can see people you're working with who are successful. You can. You know, integrate things from their business that works for you. Ask questions. They can give you advice, like even tasting. I have like five or six people in the kitchen with, that we work in. You can give them a donut, see what they think, and they'll tell you really clearly. You know, if this is garbage or not. Um, so getting that feedback from people in the industry is important. Um, you know, I I think we're still so small. I can't give a lot of advice yet. Um, and I, honestly, a lot of it was dumb luck anyway, so I would hesitate to recommend that anybody do what we did. I'm not even sure how well it would translate into something else. But um, start small, ask questions, get advice, choose a product that people have proven to like. You know, I wouldn't start making, you know, ube mochi donuts and, and expect a uptake. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I guess that's I guess that's as far as we've gotten in the process so far. But ask me in a couple of years. I may I may have some additional. Uh, I've learned some learned some things through Hard Knocks too, and uh, I might have some other hints at that point. And what about people that are just like on the precipice, on the edge of kind of taking the leap? Uh, for an entrepreneurial endeavor right. like what do you say to them like how do you know when it's the right time like because a lot of things like this I mean if you want to know everything I mean you can spend the rest of your life like taking the time right. to pick pick the right moment pick the right time and in like 40 years later you're still gathering knowledge it's and so have never interesting you say that I mean we've I got a call from a lady a couple weeks ago she was going to invest $70,000 in this venture. Uh, and she had done so much research. I'm talking reams of market research. And the idea wasn't great, objectively. I was like, I'm not sure how this is going to work. But she had done so much stuff and talked herself into it. And she was a, a really high, she's a, a nurse um, making a lot of money. And I'm thinking like, you know, you can do all the research in the world, but you, know, you got to make sure that you're going to make a living here. You know, um, I think it's got to be a gut thing and you've got to have cash flow. I think you need to know from out of the gate that you're going to be selling stuff, especially anything related to the food industry. You can't hope that it's going to get better over time. Never. It's going to go boom at first, then it's going to plateau. You have to hope that it plateaus at a high enough level where you're able to make a living. You can't just like, um, I, it, it, it's interesting. I think making a huge investment right up front after doing a lot of research is really scary. I think the prudent way is to try to ease into it in a more organic way. That's what we did. Like if I had gotten a storefront and started making donuts on Uri Drive, paying eight thousand dollars a month rent. I, we'd probably be dead. I mean, you, you, I would have not. I would have made so many mistakes and driven away so many customers right off the bat. I don't know if we could have bounced back from it, you know. But being in the truck and doing dumb stuff and you know, flop falling on our face a bunch and, and being able to do that fail small was really helpful for us. But that that analysis thing you were talking about was really interesting because I never had that problem. In fact, I had kind of the reverse problem in my life. I, I kind of leapt and then looked after, on the way down, <laughs> um, which has its own you know, pros and cons. Um, I kind of just made it work wherever I ended up and just did some really dumb stuff in my life, but it still happened. Um, but I do see, I, mean, I have other people around me that would rather watch YouTube videos than actually do anything, you know, or than actually try this business venture or whatever which I never did. I mean, yeah, I watched a few YouTube videos about stuff, but I was kind of the, op I had the opposite problem. So I don't know, somewhere in the in between is probably the right way to do it. Don't research too much, but I would research more than we did, definitely. Um, we just kind of got lucky with the donut thing. I literally drove to Dallas and just bought whatever the guy had on the floor in his, in his donut supply shop. I didn't even do any equipment research. Um, but yeah, there's gotta be a middle ground in there somewhere. <laughs> it definitely would help your marriage if you don't just show up with a bunch of donut equipment. <laughs> yeah, but fortunately we sold some stuff because that would have been bad. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean though. All right, well, I'm, I'm down to my, my final question with you. Um, so um, your wife, Michelle, is Canadian. Right. Um, you guys have lived in other cities. Um, so my question is, from, from your perspective, what can shreveport Bossier do to become one of the next great small cities? I guess I don't have a lot of experience in the administrative level of the city yet, but the community here is amazing. It's, uh, it's a little hard to break into if you're not from here, I would think. Um, me being born here and not having to really learn the culture, I just knew it automatically. I mean, you just instinctively get it. But I'm not sure it's doing anything wrong. I think it's it's got a lot going for it. It's uh, the small business community is incredibly supportive. I mean, we've had 
direct competition give us helpful advice, you know, and on equipment, on, you know, product. And, you know, that's been incredible to, to be able to plug into that and to have that resource. And there's not really a cutthroat element here at all. It's, we all live together and you're going to see that person at Brookshire's the next day. You know, so <laughs> you can't go too far off, right. off course. And even people that you, you, you know, get into it a little bit with, you patch it up a week later because you got to, you know, you're working right next to them. So that small town feel is, is really cool. Um, we've got a lot going for us. I mean, as a cus- our customer base, Barksdale is huge. You know, you get people from all over the country that have all these different backgrounds and they, they're not set in their ways of what they eat and what they do and how they spend their money and they love to try new things. So the airmen have been incredible for us. Um, LSU Med School, incredible for us. Those those guys just like to try new things and they'll go out of their way to find you. And, um, you know, we've got I-20 corridor, I-49 corridor. Being close to Dallas has been great. Not far from New Orleans. Um, it's got a lot going for it. I don't, I'm not really sure why it hasn't changed a lot in 20 years. I haven't put my finger on that yet. I don't know. Um, especially when you look at other cities in the south like Birmingham, Nashville, Dallas. I mean, those are slightly bigger markets, but they've grown like times four, times five in the last you know twenty years. And um, and Shreveport's just kind of treading water. But you know, I'm not sure if it's a systemic thing or if it's just uh, I'm not sure what it is. But I definitely think there's great great potential here, um, and I really hope that people start to see it. Downtown's really coming back in a big way. I mean, absolutely beautiful old buildings, um, super clean, just a really, that's where we, we rented there while we were waiting for our house to close. So we, um, we really enjoyed downtown. Um, I, you know, I, I can't really say why, why things haven't really taken off here, but I think that there's great potential and the fact that it hasn't taken off is really attractive from a business point of view, honestly. I mean, there are so many amazing things I want to do here and unfortunately I'm just one person, you know, but hopefully, you know, other young entrepreneurs will will start taking a chance and and, uh, seeing what what great potential Shreveport Bossier has and will invest some time and money and and take a chance on it. And I think it's, I think the future is positive here, definitely. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Tell folks out there, just do a little um, guidance and direction in terms of where they can find you, the best way to keep tabs on Drip, um, sure, uh, and all of that. So we post on our um, on our website, Drip Donuts, two Ps. We post our schedule every week. And on our Facebook and on our Instagram, we post our schedule where we're going to be. Uh, we're really diligent about showing up. That's kind of one of the one of the big issues with food trucks is there's a lot of moving parts and things break a lot and a lot of reasons you can't get there some days. But we make it a point to show up. And maybe one out of twenty or one out of thirty, we something happens. But if we say we're going to be there, we're going to be there. Um, What's the best way to contact you? Is the best way to... to, to That's trickier. Okay. <laughs> uh, Facebook Messenger. Okay. We're pretty good about it. Um, sometimes on weekends it just gets overwhelming. And I, can't, I can't even look. I'm like 40 messages. Yeah. Whatever. But um, we don't really do special orders unless it's a, a big catering event. Uh, but we're working on that functionality. So Facebook Messenger is great. Uh, Instagram Messenger... We try our best to respond, and if you've got an event or you've got a neighborhood you want us to come out to, just let me know. We'd love to do it. Well, for you guys out there, like I said, um, a total game changer. If you hadn't had a drip donut, uh, get one ASAP. And Caleb, thanks so much for Definitely, being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. I really Absolutely. enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you. Thank you.